Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event, and it's my great honor to say a few words of introduction and then to the afternoon speaker, Dr. Lobsang Sangi. It turns out that Dr. Sangi and I arrived at Harvard in the same year, in 1995. He had already completed his BA and Bachelor of Law degrees, degrees at Delhi University in 1992, and was a member of the Center Executive of the Tibetan Youth Congress. After his come to Harvard on a full ride, he continued the study of the law and was awarded a master's degree in 1996, and in 2004, he earned his doctorate degree in law. He was, and perhaps still is, the first Tibetan intellectual to have done so. While at Harvard, Dr. Sung has been engaged in organizing and taking part in a series of non-official conversations between Tibetan and Han Chinese scholars, diplomats, and government officials. Periodic meetings were held here at Harvard to this effect over the last decade or so. He's lectured and continues to lecture widely on contemporary Tibetan issues in the United States and abroad. After much soul searching, and he decided to become a candidate for the post of Kalantripa, roughly the equivalent of prime minister for the Tibetan government exile that is centered in the Ramsala, India. The election results will be officially posted tomorrow evening, but the pre-election talk of various towns suggests that Dr. Sangye has handily won the elections. I look forward to addressing him as Mr. Prime Minister or Mr. Kalan Chipa, if I'm fortunate to introduce him next time he gives a speech at Harvard. The timing of this particular election is crucial. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has officially retired from political life, so that the position of Kalan Chipa, or Prime Minister, has therefore gained much in importance. Indeed, we may be at a critical juncture, and it is my personal hope as is the hope of many that a political solution may be reached between the Tibetan government in exile and the Chinese government. In this afternoon's speech, Dr. Sangye will speak on the role of the Kalantripa, his own campaign, and the electoral process that leads up, or that leads up, led up, to the election. After his talk, perhaps the last, before the election results are officially posted, we will have around 50 minutes, that is 50 minutes, during which time Dr. Sang will take questions and comments on his speech, that is, on the substance of the speech that he has just given. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Sangye. Uh, thank you, Professor Wanderkai, for your kind introduction. And uh, after 16 years, if I get elected as you predicted, then you still get to enjoy Harvard University then, but I have to go to India, <laughs> rather return to India and take the responsibility. So we'll see what happens uh, tomorrow night. Uh, by definitely by Wednesday morning we will know the result. And uh, maybe I'll continue to stay here, then you get to hear how I lost the election, you know? <laughs> that might be the next topic of my uh, talk. Uh, so uh, actually, we, when we planned uh, for this talk, I just came to say you know, uh, uh, hello to Professor Merle Goldman and uh, Lydia Chen. And it so happened that uh, they suggested I give a talk. And uh, at that time, I agreed. And I also thought it might be quite interesting, perhaps exciting, to do it two days before, or a day before the result is announced. But then uh, now I'm realizing that timing was really bad <laughs> because I get tons of requests from media, uh, especially through email, and my phone keeps ringing. Then I have to you know, reply to a lot of media. Uh, the question is always, if you get elected, what would you do? What are your priorities? Things like that. And uh, I've been trying to cope all that, as Professor Wanderka reminded me during lunch, without, uh, 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 without an assistant. Uh, so, uh, so far, I've been handling it okay. Uh, from tomorrow on, uh, let's see what happens. When the rubber uh, uh, hits the road, the reality will come in. Perhaps this might be the best day of my pre-election day, right? <laughs> As when I look back, as that was the best day, you know? <laughs> the reality checks in. Perhaps this might be the honeymoon of my uh, campaign, so to speak, when I go back to the Ramsala and assume responsibility if I get elected then I realized that, oh, maybe this is what, what I, not, I did not bargain for, so to speak, you know. Then I'll be sending you a lot of you know, emails uh, to keep those, to keep those uh, emails private. Uh, 
And what I'll do is, you know, then because it's not a good time for the talk, because I've been juggling a lot of things, and I thought perhaps I should start with a lot of uh, some pictures of my uh, campaign trips, so give, give you the, uh, the brighter side of it. Then I'll uh, try to do some heavy lifting at the end. What does it mean? You know, what is a Tibetan government exile? What are the responsibilities? Things like that. So these are the three candidates, as you can see. The one in the middle is uh, Kung Wotashi Wongdila, uh, veteran uh, diplomat. Uh, he has been in the service of the Tibetan government exile for the last 40 years, uh, ministers of many departments. And uh, this side is uh, former prime minister, Denzing Tedongla. And over that side is me. So as you can, uh, so we were the remaining candidates for the uh, post. Uh, in the preliminary round, actually, there were other three additional candidates. One was the Speaker of the Parliament, Deputy Speaker, and uh, Private Secretary of uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama for 15 years. So I was going kind of against, should I say, or competing with um, five really veterans of Tibetan government exile. And it so happened that I was not only the youngest, but also the least experienced in the sense I have never worked in the government exile for even a single day. So I'll show you a photograph where the primary criticism against me was, you have no experience working in Dharamsal even for a single day. You have not worked as a uh, member of parliament or a minister. So how can you jump from uh, you know, youth activist straight to the post of prime ministership? So that was the criticism. <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, so the, we were the remaining candidates. Uh, in some ways, this is a Tibetan-style election campaign, uh, except for some Americanized youth uh, with assertive negative campaign in, in, in some section. But generally, our, uh, our uh, election was uh, friendly. For example, we shared uh, taxi rides. We shared meals. Uh, with Tenzi Tedongla, we shared uh, 12 hours taxi ride from Dharamsala to Delhi. And obviously, it was, uh, you know, we started in the afternoon, so it was getting late. And it was during the monsoon season, so the road was you know, filled with potholes. So it was not a obviously pleasant ride, but still, nonetheless, we were at the back uh, of the uh, taxi. So we're going through that, and obviously, you fall asleep. Then you wake up, then you realize the, how smooth uh, the, the roads in America, even though with the you know, uh, deficit roads aren't that good. So it was very bumpy. And then suddenly we realized this, this taxi driver uh, doesn't uh, consider uh, what we call uh, uh, street lights as that important. So <laughs> even this, right, just, <laughs> we just by, we were like, you know, <laughs> quite shocked and say, wait, this is, if this is the way we go for another four or five hours, then we might be in danger. But then you are so exhausted, you fall asleep. Then suddenly I woke up, then realized that this taxi driver also was so tired, he stopped the car by the roadside, by the highway side. And then he also dozed off. So then I looked around, there's a lot of trucks passing by, you know, with like only a few feet away. <laughs> so any uh, truck could have given a nudge and we could have been in the river. Uh, so, uh, with, uh, so we share meals, we meet on the way, you know, so it was a friendly match. We kept it uh, as positive as uh, one possibly could be. So it, was not, it wasn't any na a nasty campaign as such. So this was the debate organized in New York, and so organizers, as you can see at the backdrop, there's the Tibetan national flag. Uh, so here I was uh, talking to uh, mainly monk audience uh, in South India, I think mostly in Mengkot area. Here I went to uh, visit uh, 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 institute uh, with uh, students or children with disabilities, you know. Um, yeah, I was in Simla talking to students, to primary school. So uh, that's one of my campaign posters, actually. <laughs> Those are my three principles on which, uh, you know, that was my campaign platform, unity, innovation, and self-reliance. But anyway, these posters are all made by supporters, and I have no control over it. Uh, interestingly, actually, um, some of my uh, supporters made a website uh, with the snow line as the symbol, 
And because my second name is Lion, Lobsan Senge is second name. And it so happened that our national flags also have, national flag also have line, you know, two lines. And the election symbol that I also got through lottery, I was also uh, snow line, so a lot of coincidence, yeah. So this uh, young boy, uh, you know, uh, if you go to YouTube, you, uh, you will see uh, he composed a rap song <laughs> uh, uh, promoting me and my candidacy. Uh, so uh, his father is a big time uh, kind of, uh, he made a lot of videos and DVDs uh, of my campaign. So it's uh, in, in Darjeeling, my, uh, my school. So it's one of the Tibetan settlements. Uh, you might not notice because of the uh, sun, actually it is in Ladakh, I think 3,700 meters high. Uh, it was in March, uh, minus degrees, very cold actually, so all you can see all, every, all of them wrapped up. Um, at the back side, that was my room actually where I slept, I think. And uh, at night you have to put on this heater with a cylinder, in a gas cylinder. And the heat was, uh, for some reason, I think gas leaked and uh, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was, uh, yeah, I had, I had a close call actually. <laughs> Uh, but I, so as I'm, I'm alive here, so, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, again, you can see, you know, the, again, this is uh, near the border of Tibet, because March 20th or 19th, on the day, it was minus 40 degrees, so the, uh, so when, when I say the Tibetan election, Tibetans are scattered in 30 countries, uh, even in India, 50 some places. So, uh, this border of Tibet, uh, and minus 40 degrees, these are the local election uh, officials. They're carrying, you know, the ballot papers on donkeys or horses. And the people walk for a few hours, in three to six, even ten hours, to vote. So, uh, so it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a major undertaking. So, and then if you go down to south, to Bandra settlement, uh, there uh, around March 20th, I don't know, but... Uh, April, May, the temperature will be plus 40 degrees Celsius, you know. So, uh, so from Alaska to Australia, you have to cross continents and countries and, uh, and Brahmaputra River. I'll, I'll share that story later. Uh, this is Dhamsala. Again, a uh, bit of negative campaign. As you can see, there are posters, uh, my posters, my campaign posters behind. And in English, it says, no experience, you know, <laughs> some of the <laughs> supporters of the other side. And then, and then in Tibetan, they say, it says, nyam nyung me, no experience again, you know. So, so even though you paste your posters, they make it sure that, you know, that my uh, weakness is being uh, uh, noticed. So, so I said, why not we take a picture right in front of those? <laughs> so I took that picture, yeah. And the Boston Globe, when they published the front page uh, article, that was the picture, actually, I think. <laughs> it, it actually says, no ex-prince. Uh, yes. So, so that's, that's good, you're not from the royal family. <laughs> no, it does say, no, yeah, no ex-prince, ex yeah, I think. <laughs> Once it's experience as well, yeah. But Tibetan is very clear, nyam nyung me, you know, very simple, straightforward. So we have a bit of, uh, should I say, Americanized or Indianized youth, you know. And... Uh, This is the football team in South Belokopi. The one holding uh, the ball is the, uh, our Tibet national football team's goalkeeper. So uh, he t uh, told me to kick a ball, and I did, and I scored. <laughs> so, Bangs, uh, this is my uh, 15 minutes of fame, so to speak, after the vote, you know. Some Indian journalists wanted to ask me, uh, questions. Not just Indian, actually. Tons of media were there, actually, that day. So this is the, this inside the Tibetan parliament. So we have uh, 43 members of parliament. And uh, Where is the in, in Dharamsala, yes, in India. So this side, all the ministers, the prime minister, Samdur Rinpoche, and ministers sit, and the rest are all members of parliament here. So we have representatives from uh, uh, five 
uh, four Buddhist sects and uh, uh, Pembo sect, and uh, ten from three regions, uh, two from Europe, now two from America. So we'll have 44 member of parliament, so uh, members of parliament. And uh, so these are the people I have to deal with. We have two parliamentary sessions, winter session and summer session. And winter is when uh, the budget is being discussed and approved and summer all the social, political, economy issues. So uh, they are considered my, uh, should, should I say, the opponent as far as power is concerned. So uh, they're all veterans, you know, so they, I'm sure they're all waiting for me to come. <laughs> so this is the ballot paper, as you can see. So you get election symbol, your name, and photograph also so that you make no mistakes. Uh, you must have this green book. This is what we call freedom voluntary tax. It's kind of a contradiction. Uh, uh, it's voluntary, but you have to pay tax, though. It's a freedom tax. So if you pay this, if you hold this book, then you are considered a Tibetan citizen, and you get to vote. On the day of the election in Dharamsala. So this time it seems around... Uh, 82,000 Tibetans uh, registered out of 110,000 eligible voters, of which I think 49, 50,000 voted, which means 60% uh, turnout, around 60% turnout. Oh, so he's our uh, present uh, sitting prime minister who is casting his ballot. Uh, so. Uh, so what does it mean, you know, uh, democracy without state? Uh, here I use democracy in minimal sense, free speech, to, to a great extent. And essentially, you know, uh, three pillars of democracy. So judiciary, legislation, and executive branch. Uh, we have that. Um, and then, you know, you get a right to vote to elect your leader. And there is a contradiction, paradoxes between democracy and exile. Because when you're in exile, it's an exile movement, you emphasize unity, you, em you emphasize single leadership, you emphasize single voice, because you have one goal, to restore freedom in Tibet. But when you include, or rather embrace democracy, so unity has to, you know, the democracy emphasizes or requires diversity, single leadership, opposition parties, one voice, free speech. So there's a contradiction. So, in some ways, if you, I'll show you some of the exiled governments, you will see that most of them have not adopted democracy because there's underlying contradiction or paradox between the two. Um, so Tibetan government exile, we are trying to do that. So there's a lot of paradoxes and contradiction that uh, you see challenges. So we are, this is kind of a uh, test uh, whether democracy can work without state, because if you go by the definition of democracy by Robert Dahl and Schumpeter and all that, they require state. But here, we are having democracy without state. Um, and then there's Buddhism and freedom, because if you are Buddhist, you, uh, you pray, you worship to good karma for your next life. But democracy, you emphasize freedom in this life, you know. Uh, and then traditional and democratic legitimacy. So, uh, so with the Chinese government, the question of legitimacy, whether the Tibetan government exile enjoys legitimacy or not, Chinese government uh, uh, says it does not. Uh, but what we say is we do. We, not only we have traditional historical legitimacy, now we have democratic legitimacy as well, because Tibetans exile vote, participate, and elect our leader. So um, this is some of the, for those students who want to study exile, you know, this is a an, an school of thought that uh, you can, you can study, because there has been many uh, successful exile uh, cases. Spanish, I just included it there. there. There's a question whether it succeeded or not. But uh, many of the exile uh, uh, governments or organizations succeeded in returning to ho homeland in one form or the other, either by restoring democracy or independence or freedom or autonomy. In the case of Aceh, it will be autonomy. You know. Uh, and then we are not alone. So there are a few other exiled governments in this world as well. And some are just a website, but still, you know, uh, they make their, 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 their presence is felt virtually. And there are some serious uh, exiled governments as well. So you can see Uyghur, Burma. Um, 
Now, what does it mean as His Holiness Dalai Lama announced that he will retire from his political role, uh, which means now by the, at the end of May we will have a special meeting, we have a parliamentary session, and special meeting will discuss the role of His Holiness, because His Holiness has been insistent, yeah, very insistent, he's persistent, he has said it very, very strongly that he wants to retire, and people have rejected it, rather appealed to him not to retire for se several times. He is persistent now, we have no option but to accept his uh, kind of request. Uh, having said that, it's not easy for us to say, accept his, you know, uh, absolute retirement. So, uh, obviously, in the, at the end of May, we will have a general, a special meeting where we'll discuss the role of his holiness, most likely as an elder statesman, you know. And then the elected prime minister will be the head of the government and will be the political face and the spokesman for the Tibetan people. So when I say Tibetan government exile, you know, it is a government, functioning government exile. So there are 460 some employees in Dharamsala alone. There are uh, seven uh, ministers and uh, each department runs different programs. For example, education minister runs about uh, 150 schools, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And the uh, uh, religion department has around 250 plus uh, monasteries. Uh, and then uh, health ministry has about 70 or 80 clinics, hospitals, and things like that. So it's a, it's a functioning, effective uh, government. And we have 12 semi-embassies around the world, one in New York and uh, in Geneva, uh, Paris, Brussels, uh, South Africa, uh, Taiwan, Australia, so many places. So we do have uh, uh, a court as well, it's called Supreme Judicial Commission, which decides all civil cases. Uh, we can't decide on criminal cases because it touches on sovereignty, so we refer it to, we have no option, also we refer it to the Indian uh, court system. But civil cases are decided by our courts, our court, and then, then Parliament in, in exile, as I said, you know, passes legislation in the winter session and summer session like any other uh, democratic country. So obviously, you can see China Daily, uh, that's 2009. And recently, uh, People's Daily, I think, had a column uh, saying uh, terrorists, quote-unquote terrorists, likely to uh, head the government in exile. And uh, they put the label terrorist to me, so, so I'm already labeled a terrorist by People's Daily. I'm sure they will do so tomorrow, day after more will come. So they have been questioning, you know, whether Tibetan government exile is secular or not. But after this election, they cannot uh, criticize that because His Holiness Dalai Lama will be withdrawing from political role. And the next prime minister, whoever gets elected, all three of us, as you can see from the photograph, are all lay people, you know, secular people. Uh, so if you go by 1960-1990, His Holiness Dalai Lama appointed Kalun Tripas. 91-2000, Dalai Lama nominated candidates and the parliament approved. 2001-2011, directly elected by the people as the head administrator. Now the change will be third directly elected, head of the government in exile. And uh, So vote, voter turnout, uh, 67,000 people registered in 2001. It increased to 72,000 in 2006. 2011, 82,000 uh, registered voters. So, so we'll have around 60% 60, 60 turnout this time. So it has been increasing rapidly. That this time the election was very exciting at least in, in the Tibetan context and a lot of enthusiasm and increased participation so now, um, so this is, this is where I'm blamed as well as given credit for. The old rules of Tibetan campaign is no debates at all. So we, we didn't have uh, debates among candidates. Uh, there was actually, last time there was, a, a just for namesake. Uh, so no campaign or you don't visit the electorates, you don't visit voters. And the standard line was, I will not stand for the posts, but if people vote me in, then I'll serve, you know. Uh, 
so that was the uh, so new rules. Actually, I'm blamed and given credit for this. So I literally went. I use what I call Americanized, Indianized kind of a, a camping style. I literally went to all the Tibetan settlements in India, uh, remote corners, um, and in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, but then I had to find a middle way where I should not be seen as too Americanized or too Indianized. Then I'll be uh, what I call blamed for being too aggressive, you know, which is not so appreciated in the Tibetan community. So I had to campaign without campaigning. So I asked for a vote without saying so, so that even if I lose, so I remain a Tibetan in that sense. So I win as a Tibetan even though I might lose the post. So I had to think, think a lot. So Kennedy School, you know, Harvard helped me a lot in <laughs> finding the middle ground. So it seems it worked, it worked uh, fine. So, uh, so if you're interested, I'll let you know, actually. You know, when you travel, uh, literally you have to travel for 20 hours by taxi from one place to another. Then you reach in the middle of the night, either midnight or past midnight. You sleep four or five hours, give talk in the morning, in the afternoon, then travel another 10, 12 hours, then sleep for a couple of hours. So that, that's how it was. So uh, finally, uh, we made it to the destination. Uh, so those kinds of experience, you know, uh, are quite challenging. Uh, so as you can see, I, I said most of the things. Uh, you have to literally travel to countries, not a district or even a country, right? Barack Obama had to travel all the way only to Hawaii, right? Other than that, he didn't have to travel that far. But we really have to travel everywhere. So uh, it could be minus or plus 40 degrees. Or oh, we had 17 rounds of debates between me and the former prime minister. Uh, and crossed Brown for the river, 20 hours, five countries. That, uh, we did, I did nine, nine in five countries in nine days. That was the final stretch. So what is the reward? If I get elected, what will be my salary? My salary will be $400 a month. And I believe there is no provision for cook because the present prime minister, as you saw, he is a monk. He lives a very Gandhian, austere kind of life, and he lives very uh, in a very simple way. He doesn't need cook, you know. So uh, that's the reward. But other than that, the bigger reward, again, uh, the uh, uh, bigger reward, obviously, as a Tibetan, I see uh, this as an honor, really, as a privilege uh, to serve your people and your uh, country. So as far as uh, personal gain or interest is concerned, or physical comfort is concerned, I think it's on the minimum side. But the mental satisfaction or deeper satisfaction is concerned, I think it's on the maximum side. So that's what you're uh, looking for. And we will know in uh, two days' time whether I get elected or not. And this is what I'm uh, going to do. So Harvard Connection. I took a course at the Kennedy School on how to run an election campaign. I used some part of it, and it seemed to have worked. And the philosophical underpinning I used, Isha Berlin, Max Weber, as you know. Mine was more like a, it was not a vertical kind of campaign model. It was more like horizontal. Because you know, if you follow liberalism or Max Weber, any kind of institutionalization will attract bureaucracy and vested interests. So mine was like I traveled all around, had my contacts at local level. And more at grassroots, it was a bottom-up kind of approach. Uh, it worked. And uh, if you want to run for an election, you have to have your narrative right, public narrative. Again, I took a course at uh, Kennedy School by Marshall Gensch. And uh, you know he taught Obama. And it seems to have worked for Obama. It worked for me too, actually. So I got my public narrative right. And then you take courses at uh, leadership. Uh, and it does help you, you know, the holding environment. So normally. As a normal person, whenever there's tension or conflict or criticism, you take it personally. You sometimes you respond abruptly, or you know, uh, you don't actually. And then my uh, uh, training or education here at Harvard about China, India, you know, about human rights, all these were part of the package. So uh, I don't want to put too much pressure on y'all. If I fail, it will be partly because Harvard didn't prepare me well. You know, <laughs> if I succeed. It'll be, again, a partnership on our part, yeah. So again, George Bush and Barack Obama studied here. Uh, so it did help me. So they said, oh, a monk put it best. He said, oh, we don't have to question him. Look at the factory he's coming from, you know, which manufactured Lobsang Sangi. That's what they said. 
factory manufacturer, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. That's Harvard University. Uh, so it should be good. So these are the things that uh, worked for me, and I used a uh, lot of uh, knowledge and wisdom that I've learned here at Harvard uh, from East Asian Legal Studies Program. I see some of my friends and colleagues are here. I'm very proud to be associated with them. And I'll take a piece of Harvard with me and do the best I could. Hope I succeed. Uh, if I don't, I'll come back and blame you all guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, your talk. And the floor is now open for questions. Yes. Have you ever been able to live in Tibet? Unfortunately, no. I went to uh, Beijing and Shanghai in 2005. Um, and uh, I uh, went to Beida, Beijing University, and Minority Nationalities University uh, to share my thoughts with uh, Chinese scholars. As you know, I have organized a series of conferences here at Harvard, seven of them, including two between Isolinist Dalai Lama and Chinese scholars. So I've been quite active in fractal diplomacy. I've met hundreds of Chinese students and scholars here. So when I was in Beijing, I had, uh, I hoped uh, to go to Tibet. But I was told that uh, I cannot go because there aren't people uh, to receive me uh, in Lhasa. And I told that official, I said, China has 1.3 billion people. I've never heard of you know, shortage of people to receive me in Lhasa. That's the reason they gave me. And I was not allowed to go to Tibet, unfortunately. Uh, I'm curious about how you uh, financed your campaign and also if you know uh, to what extent the other candidates traveled to different regions and if you might say something about the, um, the change in this campaign from previous campaigns in terms of having the financial backing to be able to do something like the, the extensive campaigning that you did. Actually, uh, Tibetan campaign doesn't cost much as long as the most expensive part is your uh, uh, airfare, international airfare. Uh, once you're in India, uh, then uh, you are invited by local organizers uh, to give talks uh, in different settlements. And uh, if you, for $100, uh, you can reach anywhere from Delhi to Dharamsala, Delhi to Bangalore or Darjeeling, anywhere. So once you're there locally, uh, local organizers will uh, uh, set up uh, meetings uh, and then uh, you go about giving talks. Um, and only co the other costs are your posters and the DVDs you make. Uh, so you get individual sponsors for those posters. And for $100, you can have around uh, three, two, around 2,000 posters. For $200, you can have 5,000 plus posters. So that's sufficient for a campaign. If you want to make DVDs for 50 cents, at most $1 you can make a DVD. So if you want to make 500 DVDs, that's 250 or $500. Um, so that's how you, uh, you know, in that sense, it's relatively cheap, actually. And uh, uh, as far as international airfare is concerned, uh, if, let's say, Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, or Tibetan Women, whoever organizes a debate, they pay the airfare. So you go there. And once you're there, uh, you go about, you know, uh, 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 the uh, giving talks to local people, and or sometimes you have to rent a car. Again, for fifty dollars you can rent a car, or hundred dollars you can rent a car for two three days. You know, so it's relatively. We are not talking in terms of Obama is planning to raise uh, one billion dollar or dollars. That's that's not how much it costs. It just costs you at most thousand two thousand. You're talking about yeah, very limited amount. Did the other uh, travel as much as you did? Yes, not in the preliminary round, mm -hmm. but in the final round they did. When was the Constitution created? Is it a work in progress? And from the, from the looks of it, it looks... Um, I don't know if people heard me, but I asked when the Constitution was cr uh, created, if it's a work in progress. And on the face of it, it looks like the legislate, legislative branch and the executive branch, which is running the departments, uh, is the same, would be under the Kailong Tripa? 
the constitution was created uh, one in 1963 uh, and then we changed a lot of uh, those because that constitution was created for Tibet for inside Tibet and in 1991 we drafted another constitution called Charter which has uh, which is mainly for exile administration um, and then now we are going to make a lot of amendments to that charter because we are going to change a lot of provisions regarding His Holiness Dalai Lama's authority. Uh, and then we'll have an uh, amended charter now. Um, the, yeah, it's a different system actually. Legislative branch, the parliament will have uh, members elected independently <laughs> by the people and Kalyan Tripa is elected independently because we don't have party system. So the prime minister does not control majority in the parliament. So they are independent individuals in the parliament, and the uh, Kalutri was also an indi independent uh, uh, prime minister. But runs the, exec runs the department of health, education. Yes, Kalutri uh, prime minister appoints seven ministers and runs all the departments. The parliament passes legislation twice a year, and uh, that's their job. Yeah. And then they oversee or monitor whether execu executive branches, you know, uh, conductive, uh, conducting effective, effectively or not. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was curious that how you counteracted the char the uh, criticisms about having a lack of experience. How did you make your case to the public that would counteract the effect of that? Number one, and just the second question, what were the main issues that seemed to differentiate yourself from the other candidates? Um, were, there, were there any issues, or was it a matter of sort of who personally spoke to, to the viewer, to the voters more? Um, lack of experience, yeah, I, I think up front, um, I acknowledge I've never worked in Dharamsala, so I don't have that experience. Um, and then um, I defined the role of uh, Kalyan Tripa as Five, one, you have to understand the uh, situation in Tibet. And uh, second, uh, once you have understood, you have to uh, advocate and educate, create awareness at the international uh, level and seek support at the international level. And third is engage with Chinese people and confront uh, Chinese government policies. And uh, uh, fourth is um, to um, you know, uh, sustain the uh, support of Indian people and India. And fifth is administration of the exiled government. So criticism of my lack of experience was the administration part. So I kind of defined it as the role of Kalyan Tripa is fivefold, and one is the administration. And so that's how I, and then uh, people seem to have resonated actually. In, in some ways there was an atmosphere for change, and in fact, they were, it seems they were looking for a candidate who had least association with Dharamsala. Uh, so, in fact, they wanted a candidate who had, so to speak, least experience. So that's why they voted for me overwhelmingly in the preliminary round. Um, so it often happens, you know. So George Bush and uh, Al Gore, and Al Gore had much more experience than Bush. But the, it's, the, it's the mood of the people and the environment, you know. So it seems their mood, f mood was for change, and I tapped into it, and then it worked. And as far as issues are concerned, uh, not much difference, actually. Tasha Wongdila on the, on the center, uh, because he, he, he was uh, ambassador, our ambassador to Brussels till recently, so he, his line was, everything as it is, you know. Um, so that was his line, because he cannot say anything than that. Otherwise, they will say, and what have you been doing, right? And uh, Tenzin Tedongla was more on, uh, kind of a little bit on the side, he was for self-determination, you know, more on the independent side. Uh, so I was right in the middle. Uh, I was for middle way, that is you know, seeking genuine autonomy within China. Uh, but uh, I will use innovative ways to make ourselves more effectively. So I, I, in some ways, I was right in the middle of not as it is, but not such a radical or drastic change, you know, but for a change nonetheless, yeah. yeah. Have you had any contact with Chinese officials when they come abroad, for example, <coughs> to the United States, and how have they treated you? 
uh, during the campaign in the last one year or uh, my point is, have you been in contact with any Chinese officials? In, in the last year or before? Well, in the last couple of years. Um, in the last couple of years. Other than the conferences we have organized here, um, and the, some of the officials or scholars whom I met at Harvard, outside of Harvard, I have not. Having said that, when I was in Dharamsala, a lot of Chinese do come to Dharamsala, and a lot of media, quote unquote, media people were there to interview me as well. And, uh, and of course, I shared my thoughts with them because we have nothing to hide, you know? Yes. No, here at Harvard, you know, we meet on an individual basis and we have frank exchange of views. Um, nothing differently, actually. I, you know, I've organized many conferences here. Uh, and many Chinese have come, and some are uh, good friends of mine, you know, and some are ignorant, and some are nationalistic, some are liberal, you know, some are open-minded, and they treat you and they see you differently, you know, and from what kind of perspective they come from. And from my side, I've been open uh, because I believe in dialogue, and I've organized uh, conferences to engage in dialogue with Chinese uh, students and scholars. I have made a uh, lot of efforts, actually, uh, uh, towards the land. In, in some ways, my visit to China um, and organizing conferences to some extent became a liability. At least some people try to make it a liability. It was part of a criticism against me as well that I'm soft on China because I've organized conferences, things like that. But uh, people voted me, at least in the preliminary round, quite overwhelmingly, uh, which means it's interesting. Uh, people seem to agree with my line of thinking, and at least that's how I should think. Yeah, so that's where the majority of people seem to be, at least. From the photographs, it appears that monks and nuns can vote. And I wonder if there's ed any evidence that prominent lamas endorsed you or any other candidates. Prominent lamas uh, did not endorse me outrightly. But I'm also uh, kind of uh, uh, labeled as the monks like me. And you see, monks who my, they, they kind of, it's uh, considered that uh, absolute majority of them were behind me. That's the label. Uh, but no lamas endorsed me. But who endorsed me were former political prisoners, uh, Tibetans from Tibet, who have come recently from Tibet among them some very prominent ones, Tana Jigme Sangbola, who spent uh, 36 years in prison, uh, Palden Gyatso, uh, 33 years in prison, uh, Pagdo, he spent just a year or two, and someone who participated in 2008 uprising. So they also see, they also saw me as someone, um, uh, it seems I've resonated with them as well. So many prominent former political prisoners uh, endorsed me. Actually, if you go by endorsement, the former prime minister had a lot more endorsement, a lot more organization, a lot more people. Actually, when I was in Dharamsala, um, I had an event to release my uh, booklet and uh, DVD, and we were, they were, my supporters were looking for someone to introduce me, and they could not find any of prominence. You know? <laughs> and for his event, a line of you know, former ministers and present ministers, everybody, not present ministers, former ministers, a member of parliament, former department secretary, all line up and come with him. Yeah. I was essentially, when I was traveling also, essentially it was a kind of one-man show. You know? I was traveling with my you know, small handbag and get off the plane and they say, so you are alone? Yes. And uh, he had an entourage of four or five people. You know? So yes, that way, yeah, a uh, lot of endorsement for him, lack of endorsement from my side, but uh, more grassroots endorsement, so to, so to speak, where that's where the vote was. I guess I missed the chance to uh, question you during campaign, so now I ask my questions. <laughs> uh, I guess what I'm asking is, you, you, you didn't try to, uh, uh, how do I say, find a vote from China, from Tibet, real Tibet. That's, I'm assuming that's the case, so Chinese government still can easily dismiss your legitimacy as a representative <laughs> of all the Tibetan people. That's the, just a comment. Secondly, a uh, question will be, what will be changed after Dalai Lama retire from his political position? Well, I'm particularly interested in the, the China relationship. 
if you're still thinking the middle way, my question will be, you know, Dalai Lama will be very successful in terms of international campaign. But if we're dealing with China, the, the middle way so far have not produced very good, not, I mean, the substantial result. So why are you saying you can pursue the same way and to achieve, um, to achieve concrete results? Um, it, it's true that uh, physically Tibetans inside cannot vote, but through many ways they have shown that uh, they know about this election and they have participated through other means. For example, going to a monastery, lighting butter lamps, firecrackers, sending me white scarves all the way from Lhasa, all over Tibet. So you do receive some? Oh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of. Now, actually, I'm quite emboldened. I won't be, I won't shy away from challenging the party secretary of Tar, you know, if we put in the ballot box with Tibetans inside Tibet. For actually, from what I know, it seems uh, our DVDs of, you know, um, uh, our election debates were very popular inside Tibet. I was just sharing with someone, actually, that now to call from India to China uh, in, in Tibet is just one rupee per minute. That's like two cents a minute. So a lot of people call back and forth. And then for a whole year, this election becomes very, very energetic, dynamic, and exciting. So the talk of the town for almost a year was about this election campaign. And a lot of people call in Radio Free Asia and Voice America, and they also you know, uh, say their preference. And uh, what I was told that majority of them kind of preferred me. Uh, so it's quite well known, actually. Tomorrow, just watch. Something will happen uh, inside Tibet. That's why I think that's a preemptive move from the Chinese government to prevent any foreigners from going to Tibet Autonomous Region for next few months. And you can see a lot of restriction imposed in eastern Tibet as well. So they see some sense that something is going on. And I have received a lot of messages, uh, sometimes emails, uh, Facebook messages, you know. This is just in one time account. I'm just sending you, sh showing my solidarity with you, things like that. A lot of white scarves from Tibet. And then uh, you do meet some Tibetans. I was in uh, Varanasi, and that's a holy place in India. And a lot of Tibetans come. I think two or 3,000 Tibetans were coming. And many of them wanted to meet me on the quiet. They took me to some you know, places they were, they were staying and asked me to give short talks and then you know, uh, uh, gave me uh, white scarves and took a lot of pictures with me. I said, are you not, are you not scared? But said they will hide, do something to hide, you know, hide and take it back. So, uh, yeah, Tibetans inside Tibet do know about it quite a lot. A middle way, I think, you know, um, middle way is the, uh, is the policy of the Tibetan government. Middle way essentially means uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama seeks genuine autonomy within China, within the framework of the Chinese uh, constitution. So he's not challenging sovereignty or territorial integrity of China. Uh, that is the Tibetan government's policy, and if I get elected, I must abide by the policy, and I will do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, we all know that the Dalai Lama is real, uh, has been the, um, the leader uh, for many, many years, and, uh, and you, you said uh, you listed the five roles or functions of the uh, government will play, so I wonder, after the retirement of Dalai Lama, what will be the real, I mean, the real relations between you, if you are elected, and Dalai Lama? Thank you. Um, you know, His Holiness Dalai Lama is our leader, uh, will always remain my spiritual leader. He will always be my source of inspiration. So our respect and love and loyalty for him is very strong. So it's not so much to uh, replace him. Uh, but rather to live up to his expectation and fulfill his vision. Vision is that uh, if I get elected, I should be the head of the government and become the political face and spokesman of, for the Tibetan people. And uh, I will do to the best of my cap uh, you know, capacity to be as effective uh, spokesperson for Tibetan people as I could. And. Uh, Is that a true leader? I will be a follower. No, I will be uh, uh, taking in charge of the government and the political side of the Tibet issue. Yes. Sir. 
you seem to be a really different candidate from the people who've gone before you and from the other candidates and why do you think that people wanted to change and would have endorsed you for to be the next leader I think you have to ask them I think you know <laughs> uh, if I if I go down the list it, it might be too self-serving actually <laughs> um, I don't say any votes here, <laughs> Alison. Um, it seems people wanted change. Uh, I think more than I think people wanted action. I think um, Tibetan tradition tend to be, as I said, you know, other candidates they say, "I'm not standing, but if voted, I'll serve." Uh, but rather, I went and met people and I told them, "You know, if you vote for me, I'll serve." You know, uh, so I kind of uh, put myself out there. And uh, I think people uh, like that, actually, you know, who takes responsibility and upfront says, I will be accountable for your votes. So I uh, regard your votes as precious, and uh, I'm here to share my ideas. If you like it, uh, do consider me. You know? I think uh, uh, going and meeting with the people, that's, that's what I introduce. So that shows uh, direct accountability. It seems to have resonated with people, yeah. And then uh, in the preliminary round, I was the only one who traveled to most of the places. So I think that's what this, I think, uh, see in me was that I could be a really active uh, kind of candidate and perhaps uh, future Kalun Tripa, that I will be really active. The fact that I've traveled to such distances, you know, and remote places means I will do the same if I get elected. So that's what they wanted to see, I think. And essentially, yeah, they wanted to see change in the government, something new, uh, something dynamic, something innovative, and that's what I promise, and I have to deliver if I get elected, yes. Uh, thanks very much for your, your very interesting and uh, personalized presentation. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, my question is about uh, follows on one of the earlier questions about legitimacy. And how do you see separ separating the um, clerical from the secular and the direction of the government in exile that you describe towards a more democratic system uh, either helping or leading to questions or whatever in terms of legit legitimacy not only for the people that you govern, but as you represent the, this government to the outside world. In other words, how will the outside world view this further separation from the Dalai Lama to a government led by you, and then how will that then affect your relations with the rest of the world and other governments? If you define legitimacy as, you know, uh, <coughs> people's mandate, you know, then if I get elected, I will have the legitimacy because I will be voted by the people freely and with democratic mandate. If you look at the Jasmine Revolution, they say they want to remove the government without legitimacy. They want a legitimate government, in short, it's translated as democratic elected leader. If that is the definition of legitimacy, I will have that because I will be elected by the people. Second legitimacy is traditional legitimacy because His Holiness Dalai Lama is an undisputed leader of Tibetan people inside and outside. And he, for one, has extended his credibility and legitimacy to this process by saying, I am withdrawing from the political role and handing over to you. You have my blessing, you have my support, and, uh, and uh, you go about representing and speaking for Tibetan people. So he is also extending his traditional legitimacy to the process. So I'll have, if elected, both traditional legitimacy and democratic legitimacy, you know. And then um, a freedom-loving people, if, uh, you know, countries with democratic system uh, believe in, you know, democracy and people's mandate, then uh, I should have the legitimacy to speak at least for the people who voted me um, and to those people inside Tibet as well because given a choice, they will also participate in the election. And then, one thing is very clear. I will have much more legitimacy or absolute legitimacy than the party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region, right? He would have no uh, mandate from the people, uh, and uh, I will have 
a democracy mandate of the people. You know, uh, in that sense, actually, um, one reason the Chinese government is labeling me, you know, because they want to distract from this uh, question of legitimacy. Because I will have the democracy mandate, whereas the Chinese uh, 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 leaders in Tibet or Tibet Autonomous Region don't have that mandate. Obson, thank you. Uh, I actually have uh, three questions for you, uh, if you don't mind. The first question is, uh, what's your agenda for your first 100 days if you elected? Uh, my second question is regarding the, uh, somewhat related to His Holiness the Dalai Lama's retirement. Uh, how would you go about uh, the continuous, uh, continuing dialogue with the Chinese government? For example, the special envoy uh, to His Holiness, will he become the title will be changed to Special Envoy to the Kowloon Tripa. Um, okay, I think the third question now. But first, uh, so now just two questions. Thank goodness you forgot the third one. <laughs> it might be equally tough. The you know, Tibet election doesn't work like this. You know, what are your agenda for 100 days, you know, first year, things like that. I introduced the concept of manifesto, you know, <laughs> in this election. So uh, I had 10 questions, I answered them, you know in which I emphasize number one priority is always and will always remain to restore freedom in Tibet, you know, to uh, recognize and respect uh, Tibetan people's uh, dignity and identity. So that will always be the number one priority. And other than that, as I listed, international awareness, you know, uh, sustaining support of India, and, uh, you know, uh, the having conversation with Chinese people, um, and, uh, uh, and Domestically, yes, improving education will be my, my number one priority. That's what I've said. Mm, as far as this all is envoys are concerned, uh, I think we will debate this at the end of May. A special session will debate, and then you're right, actually, without having some role for his holiness in this, you know, governing. Yeah. Here we time for one last question. Yes, uh, just how long is the term? Five years. Five years. Okay. And, and, and one last one. Will you have uh, Secret Service protection? Secret Service protection, yeah, I will have. I think he's there. No, I will have uh, one person. Uh, yeah, we, we, I can, again, I just said $400. But there's uh, the, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister's office will have around 30 or 40 staff members. Mm -hmm. So there will be Chief of Staff, like any other government, Chief of Staff, Joint Secretary, things like that. And then, Yes, uh, one se se a security person with me and a driver in a car. When, when you're visiting the states, you'll have. You'll it all depends. I, I don't like those kind of things, so I might, you know, maybe we, within India, you know, security person, when I come to the states or Europe, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Because, see, you know, if they want to get you, they'll get you no matter what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one or ten is not going to protect you. So, you know, you just leave it to your karma. And. Uh, Go about doing a business. Mm -hmm. It's an extra cost. Our government doesn't you know, have I such high. When you visit the states, where you have, is there a level of acknowledgement? Because it took us a lot of years to give His Holiness a head of state designation, so he was protected when he was. Um, uh, by the State so Department. Not so sure. No discussion. Yet. Yes, no discussion yet. I think this Prime Minister, he is a Gandhian. You know, he said he doesn't need much. <laughs> yeah. Now, Lydia. So, final question. Lama prefer one or the other of the candidates? You got to ask him when it comes to <laughs> time. But I, 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 uh, the, uh, there was a long life uh, prayer uh, offering to His Holiness uh, the Alam recently, just on um, two days ago, and at the, by the uh, Tibetan uh, government uh, officials, uh, in which he said, uh, "It looks now we will have a young Kalun Tripa from the younger generation." And uh, he did say his, uh, he has, you know, his blessing is with the, with the young uh, Kalun Tripa. And he urged all the staff members to support the next young Kalun Tripa. And as, uh, same as before, he said he will always be there. So his blessing is already given. Wonderful. I think this uh, will conclude our uh, this afternoon's session. I'd like to thank Dr. Sangha and you all for your attendance. Thank you very much.